Good morning and welcome to Kunsung Pyle Chilling. We're so glad to have you join us today for another wonderful teaching by Jatsuma Akalamo. This one is entitled, Only You Can Awaken the Bodhicitta Within. And so let's find out how. Do you remember how for so many years I taught you compassion and bodhicitta and compassion and bodhicitta and compassion and bodhicitta? Well, guess what? We're going to learn some more compassion and bodhicitta and we're going to throw in some devotion since we learned a lot of that before too, but we still seem to need some more. So we'll be talking about a lot of things over the next weeks. and. Uh, one of the things that I would like for you all to do is to think about how it has been for you, let's say, in the last year or so, maybe even the last year and a half, two years, when there hasn't been a continuous stream of teachings that there was a while back, and there hasn't been anything but those old Dharma books that we have in our closets, and, and uh, there's nothing to do but walk around town in our robes and with fellas and, and just hang out. So it's been kind of funny for the last year, year and a half, two years. It's been a little strange. And for some of us, our path has changed. And we don't know it. We don't know it yet. We don't know that because we don't really have the skill very well of looking inside of ourselves and really tending our garden. We don't really know what's come up in the garden. We don't know which ones are weeds and which ones are flowers. We don't know really much of anything. Even with all of our Dharma experience, if you consider what people that were born into Dharma have as Dharma experience, they actually have a great deal more than you. And for those of you that have been practicing, even for a few years, you might think, oh, you know, I am a really, I'm an old-time Dharma student, or, you know, I've been practicing for a while, so I'm an old hand at this. And yet we haven't learned that skill of being able to really look within with clarity and wisdom and assess what's going on in terms of how our inner balance feels. Do we feel like we're all, you know, tied up in knots? Or do we feel more balanced, more well-rounded, more um, sort of gently mindful as we walk through our lives? Probably not. And one of the reasons that we say is that, um, well, we don't have a temple here in Sedona yet, and we don't have ongoing teachings. And so we might think to ourselves, well, you know, I, I, I guess as soon as the train takes off again, then I'll be on it. And, and that really, that's what we think. As soon as that train gets going, I'm going to be on it. As soon as that lady gets up on that chair and runs that train, I'll be right behind her. But unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. And really, you should know that by now, by this time. When we take on our path and we nurture it and we open books and we open doors and we open our hearts and we open our minds and we study 
academically, and we study by noticing the relationship between cause and effect. And we study through, through mindfulness, through being mindful. That is an ongoing study. So, we, so studying in those ways uh, will bring good result, but for the most part, we don't really know how to go about it. For us, we feel that, well, I think Rinpoche, the reason why I wanted to talk to old students is because I could talk more frankly. And if you remember, Rinpoche used to make jokes, Jelcha Rinpoche. Years ago, he would make jokes about Mother Duck and all her baby ducklings. Remember that? It got to be the big thing around the temple. Ducks were in. <laughs> OK. Well, for those of you that remember that, Rinpoche was making a joke, and it was kind of a compliment in a way that we were stuck together like a little duck family, and that Mama Duck was really front leading. So it was kind of a compliment. But it was one of Rinpoche's compliments, because little baby ducks don't have the brains to, pack, to carry a path or to be on the path. Little baby ducks just recognize their mama on impact and follow her wherever she goes. And that's a good thing, but you should know by now, having been out in the South 40 for a couple of years, you should know by now that it's not enough. No one person, no one guru, no one image, no one experience should be the director and the nurturer and the formulator of your path. Sure, we depend on our guru. And even His Holiness uh, strongly recommends that once you have found your teacher, you stick with that teacher and don't weaken the lineage by going off and tasting here, there, and everywhere. So yeah, the teacher is essential. And we'll learn more again about uh, in our studies on Guru Yoga, we'll learn to how to understand what that essentialness truly is. But the teacher is not responsible for your path. The teacher is like the door of liberation. And the name of the game, and we never had this opportunity or this inkling because it hasn't been that way for us, but now it is. The name of the game is, is creating such a connection through your practice of Guru Yoga, through your mindfulness, through your gentle, ongoing practice and awakening, is to create such a connection that Jay is always here. Jetsama is always here. That it's never any different. The connection should be such that Remember, in the practice of Guru Yoga, what we want to do, what the goal is, to, is to mix essence, to mix the mind with the mind of the Guru, to perceive the essential nature of the Guru that is your own nature. And it mixes together like milk with water. You can't really, without a great deal of technical equipment, I would imagine, separate milk from water. You can't really separate them. This isn't, unfortunately, how we have practiced the Guru Yoga. We've practiced the Guru Yoga more like an addict. Back in the old days, we'd pump up those veins and get them ready every Sunday and Wednesday and get another hit of sugar, energy. You know, the, uh, the, the idea of Somebody keeping your juice going, keeping you on the path, keeping the path moist and meaningful for you. And so we would go a couple of times to the teachings and we would get our bliss hit. And back in those days, we really didn't even understand you were actually supposed to look at the words of the teacher. We were just going to go and open, you know, just get some more of that sugar. And um, a lot of times, like innocent little children, we would magpie the words of the master all week long. And we would, you know, 
formulate it and shoot it back toward each other and play with it like a ball. But did we ever practice? I don't know. I'm not sure. Hopefully by now, you have learned that in the end, each of us walks through the door of liberation alone. We may understand that the nature of the guru, that that is the door of liberation, but we walk through that door alone. And if we develop the habit of relying on someone else to enforce our practice, if we rely on that kind of external idea that, um, oh, maybe Jetsama's not going to like the way I practice right now, or maybe I should do it this way. What's the newest thing? What's Jetsama like right now? Oh, she's wearing these little red, white, and blue things. We should all wear, we should, you know, all copy Jetsama. And instead of things like ducklings like that, really at this point, it would be proper and, and it would be appropriate for us to be so deep into our practice that Jetsama could literally go jump off a bridge and it wouldn't change anything about our practice. You know, throughout the world, kiddos, I hate to tell you that, but lots of people don't get to see their teacher very often. And so the ball really is in their court. I'm not saying I'm fading out even more. In fact, I plan on team coming back and, and uh, really being more close with you guys, but this time, don't waste it. Don't waste it like it has been wasted. Because I'll speak very frankly to you, one of the things that has happened to me is something that happens to a lot of llamas I have come to doubt. And what has happened to me, you get sick and tired of talking, 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 yelling across a canyon, and nothing's, no, nothing, nobody's listening. Nobody, you know, you're just screaming your head off and nobody's listening. And so there is a kind of, it's just a thing. Rinpoche, Rinpoche said that he went through it and he knows of lots of llamas that went through it. There's a kind of disappointment, but you have to buck up and come back and try it again. And that's what we're going to do. And you guys have got to realize your part in the picture. It is so important. It is so important for you not to just wear Buddhist clothing and carry Buddhist books and go to Buddhist meetings and talk Buddhist things. That's not what being a Buddhist is all about. That will get you exactly nothing. In order to really engage in the path, you have to have the art of Dharma a powerful and deep source within you. A source so deep that it doesn't matter if one day your teacher's doing something and then the day they do something else and maybe in Jetsama's case one day her nails were long and one day they weren't. And doesn't that change a thing? Well, no, not really. We have to have devotion so strong that it bursts through outer appearances. Because that's what Dharma is supposed to do anyway. That's the point. That's why we're here, is to burst through the illusion and the narcotically of appearances and to get to the heart of the matter. It is most important that as we sink in and make another run for the goal, that realize the Dharma, that the great bodhicitta is part of the matter. Otherwise, we find ourselves being people dressed up as Dharma people. You know, like, remember Rinpoche said, brocade wrapped? No, shit wrapped in brocade. <laughs> brocade wrapped in. <laughs> anyway. So, otherwise, that's what it is. It's nothing. It's just nothing. You have nothing. You're walking and talking in a dream, just like those people are. And if you've ever driven up 89A and really looked at them, that'll scare you.
the depth of your practice, the depth of your intensity, has to be born in you. It has to bloom in you. No teacher can take the bloom or the blossom of their realization and thrust it into you. No teacher can do that. Only through your, your intention, only through your sincerity, only through your ceaseless effort, can this garden, this blooming, begin to happen within you? I think we, we're so confused, the confusion so deep. I, I know you can see it sometimes, you can see little layers of it, sometimes you can be, see big shovelfuls of it, but the confusion is so profound that we honestly think that if we walk around in Dharma colors, and, and don't do the far bad things, you know, and, and, and try very hard, you know, to, to, you know, keep that, don't do those five bad things, keep the conduct. And so, you know, the main things, the other things, we don't care about that. And so we think if we just walk around, try this little bit, and wear these clothes, and have these beads, that something's going to change. Well, nothing's going to change. You must know that by now. In your confusion, do you really think if you act like a proper Buddhist practitioner that it's going to change you, that it's going to change anything, that it's going to change your action? We know by now that, I hope, that suffering and unhappiness, as the Buddha says, are due to desire, and desire is dependent on perception, so that if we change our perception, and instead invest in a consistent mindfulness with pure perception, being at its core, that if we don't engine that, we're just basically a big turd wearing robes. And there really just isn't any other, other, other way to put that. You are fulfilling the form, and the mind becomes exactly the same. Mind becomes it like on the outside. The mind is filling the form. It might have some precepts that you've memorized, but but like like someone who has, has filled filled the form, but inside is nothing. Our minds become like our minds become kind of stiff and rigid, engaged in remembering kind of outer dharma things, you know. And, but then the inside, the inside, the deepest part of our mind remains nebulous, unchanged, churning, churning, churning around the way it was if we had never had any teaching or any practice. And there are many that, that as you know, that, that practice, practice, that practice um, studying and they, and they come and they, and they learn and they hear a lot of facts. And yet still they have not awakened on a wisdom level to where the meaning of Dharma can be born in their hearts. And that's once again, this inner mindfulness, this inner connection for which only you can take responsibility has not happened. I think about uh, let me see. A good analogy would be what's happened to our country recently, in a way. Well, many of us are really living here, right? I mean, it's a pretty good country. It's not, but it's one of the better ones. And uh, we like living here, and it's a pretty country, and everything. We love our freedoms. Don't try to take our freedoms away. We really love, and we love that we can go to the store and buy pretty much anything we want, and that we can do anything that we want on an ordinary level. That's not something you see all around the world, and we love that. But we love that unconsciously. And then suddenly, when September 11th happened, suddenly people that never felt patriotic in their lives, or didn't think they were like that at all, 
We're standing up and going, not in my country. And everybody's feeling really suddenly like, hey, you can't do that. We're, we're American. We, you know, this, this place stands for freedom from that kind of suffering. And so these passions become housed. And so, a lot, and so with Dharma, we're too. We know that we're Dharma practitioners. And we have it in our minds, and it's there. And we know we like to practice Dharma. We know that Dharma is the best religion. <laughs> we know of all of them, it's one. And, and, and we have all these little childish ideas and little childish thoughts. But then suddenly when we see our teacher or when we go to a practice and we see all the robes or maybe something, um, a picture of monastery or something like that that arouses us, yes, we are dumber practitioners and we really do stand for that stuff. And it becomes roused in us again. See, that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Because each and every one of us know the value of Dharma in a particular and personal way. And the only way that you can know Dharma in a particular and personal way is to use Dharma for what it was meant to be used for. And that is purifying our own poisons. That's what Dharma is supposed to do. Day, day by day, our practice, our mindfulness, our view, our intention, our activities. Day by day, day as we work with Dharma and milk the nectar out of it, this is what the result is. That gradually, 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 our poisons Compassive. And that is what Dharma is for. To purify our world perceptions, to pacify our ignorance, our greed, our hatred, our, uh, all of them, uh, slothfulness, all of our poisons, to pay them in such a way that the mind can recognize the profound primordial nature. So, are you any closer to that? than you were two years ago? Not, I don't think so. Not much. Maybe some further away. How does that happen? It happens again because we become sort of complacent, sort of okay with journals of Dharma. That becomes enough. And we think as long as we have that, you know, I have my robes on my altar. I, I'm ever, as long as I have that, I have some kind of um, some kind of rock to hold on to. But do you know? It, it's good that you think that way in a way. But do you know people, ordinary people, feel exactly the same way? Very ordinary things. We feel that way out. Everything from teeth to toilet paper. We, we know that there might be problems that you've got to play in the toilet paper. I don't want to be without that. And then you feel, well, I'm safer now than I was before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but that's not how it, that's just an external symbol. And when you use Dharma that way, it's ordinary. It becomes ordinary. Dharma is supposed to save your life. It's supposed to change the world. And yet we can't even be mindful enough to work on our own five poisons. We can't even use Dharma that much to work on our own poisons. Instead of working on our own poisons, we think, now let me see, I have to wear gold and burgundy. How much can I get away with here? Say, I'll wear something gold that's ruffled and something burgundy that's not. And together, they'll look good. You don't think like that. We think like, how far can I push the line? You know, how can I, where's a little niche? Can I make myself real comfortable if I do this much pushing or that much pushing? And we're all 
place with it. We're treating exactly like something ordinary. We're just like babies who can't get to bed on time. You know, push it, 9, 9 10, 9, 15. Push, push, push. Until you feel like you've got something, you've got some success. And then what? You've got nothing. But the Dharma that we love, we protect, and we try to uphold is languishing in our hearts. Just languishing in our hearts. When do we look inside at our own qualities, our own poisons, and see how to increase our good qualities and how to abandon our bad qualities? We haven't gotten better at doing that because we haven't gotten any better at seeing our bad qualities. And we haven't gotten better at seeing our bad qualities because we didn't listen about that the first time when I talked all those years about spiritual fidelity and a dynasty with the path. <clears throat> but now we have to listen, and here's why. Any of you that have any clairvoyant touches or have a little bit of psychic something or other or are just plain old sensitive, you might have noticed that the world feels very different than it did before the recent terrorist event. And it feels very different because in our, there have suddenly been, how many people are in this country? Two? 300 million, something like that? Huh? Five million. No, I think it's about 300 million. That's what I think. Okay, good. We'll go with that one. <laughs> 270 million people were shocked a few, you know, three weeks ago. And it woke them up. Many of them are scared. And many of them are angry. And many of them don't want anything to do with any swarthy people anymore. They just have these ideas. You get four of the people out of my country. We have all forms of ideas that are just going around. <clears throat> and suddenly people are going, good people are going, well, how come we haven't slammed them back? Yet? What the heck's on? Is America on soft? These are good people. The bad ones are saying even worse things. This is the kind of idea that people who have had their mind whatever, their own lives, suddenly we're jolted bolt upright and there is a thought field that is just really tough to get through right now. What this thought field is all about is that everybody is looking outside of themselves. Everybody's looking for the enemy out there. Everybody's looking for somebody to hate. Everybody's looking for somebody to blame. Now we're all We've got, you know, the government's t uh, telling us you, you, we need to have a, a national neighborhood watch. Which means that everybody's looking for swarthy people. We're all looking for them. Anybody with dark skin, dark hair, could be the next one. And, you know, we're pretty sane people around here. But, you know, you've picked up on it. I have. I could just feel the, the want to pounce back rising. And I never thought I did any say in his administration, but has been fairly level-headed about it. We don't know, you know, uh, Americans' tendency has always been to look back immediately and ask questions later. You know, and, and, and there has been much more level-headedness about this. And I think it's because we really realize that uh, this is, this is a, a catastrophic event that affects the whole world and affects it very strongly, not just two buildings and, and, uh, and the Pagan. So this thought field is so strong, and it's so pervasive right now, that world karma, remember I taught you that individuals have karma, groups have karma. It's a mixed group cohesion kind of karma. Communities have karma, nations have karma, planets have karma. Well, feeling what's going on right now, it's so terrifying to me. Because 
Even those people that are like peaks that are saying, don't fight back, think of another way. The street's going, ah! You know? Everybody's, oh, um, just like an individual consciousness, when there's a heavy churning and tumultuousness, and when everything's just all shook up, karma can ripen like that. So in the same way that lamas will tell you, and I have told you, that should anything really horrible happen to you, like even something catastrophic, try to mind. Because if you don't, ripening can just be pulled up left and right. And everything will happen so quickly and, and with so much turmoil. So this is what's happening to the nation. Even to the extent that you see on TV, on CNN, and every now and then somebody motherly will come on and do that hand-wringing thing and say, what will we tell our children? Well, <laughs> what, what I know America isn't going to tell her children is to, is to show that this is, is an example of what happens when people allow hate to grow any reason in their minds. They're going to tell their kids that. Now, I hate to disagree with old Laura Bush, but to tell your child they're safe and loved isn't really getting the best opportunity here. Because first of all, if they don't know they're loved by now, you haven't done well. And they're safer than you are. And we're not all that safe right now. But you can teach your children, and you can learn for yourself that the first thing you have to do, have to do when the world goes ugly, and when people are hateful, and they're giving rise to these ideas, like, you know, even good people are picking up the vibe from other people and saying, I really wish we'd bomb somebody. You know, really good people that wouldn't hurt purpose. Or just disconnecting and going with that rah-rah, kind of let's fight vibe. And, and, and this is the kind of thing that we have to point out our children. We have to point out that this is the very time when we should step back from that. And, the, and, and we should counteract happening in the world right now because there is so much hate, so much throwing around, and so, much, uh, so many energies back and forth shooting at each other that the best thing for us to do right now is Buddhists is to get deeper into our practice and purify our own five poisons. We have to purify our poisons now because no one else is doing it. We're going into a different phase in the evolution of our planet. Just while, nobody's going to be looking at their self, their own faults, not nationally and not individually. It's a different vibe. I saw this when I was very young. I knew that I would be living in a time when the world would split in half. I've always known that. I didn't know what it would be or how it would come. But I know that this is that time. And it's a terrible, treacherous time. We are on the press, on, on standing next to an abyss with blindfolds. Really, it's like that. It is a terrible, treacherous time. The thing to do now is to sincerely go deep into your practice, whether it's sitting down and doing it the, you know, the traditional way, or whether it's walking around and being mindful and practicing that. You have got to now look when and handle your five poisons. This is the time to work on that and to enhance the virtues that you do have. This is not the time to insist on being right. This is not the time to criticize others. This is not the time to be heavy-handed and to, to act with your head and not, not your heart. This is the time to go deeper into your practice and take responsibility for what you contribute to the world. and to do so with the most profound and profoundly enhanced bodhicitta that you can manage. 
I wish that I could sort of come by and just shake all of you on the shoulders and say, wake up. Don't you know that four of you people in robes, together with the intention of bodhicitta, can counteract the, the hate-mindedness of a hundred people, of a thousand people. And yet we waste our opportunity. We avoid wearing our robes. We don't pit weed our garden. We don't practice much. We let all kinds of thoughts pollute our minds. We're insensitive to the world around us. We're just... And yet here you are, wearing the robes of the Buddha. And how rare is that in this world? Look on the TV and you see the robes of hate. I mean, one of the main Christian leaders, what was his name, I can't remember, said this is probably all due to the fact that huh? Jerry Falwell, that, that we're pacifists and lesbians and what else? What else? <laughs> I forget. Who knows? But, but he said that's why this is happening to us. Now there's some spiritual guidance for you. <laughs> because we're pacifists and lesbians. <laughs> well, Jerry, I don't know <laughs> which one you are. <laughs> but even, even the people that are godly, you know, are, are thinking like that. It's the hellfire and brimstone. We're, nobody's looking within and saying, I'm in this world. Where is the love that I can pour into this world? Where is my bodhicitta? What are my qualities like? That's not what we do. Instead, we just point fingers and wander around hopelessly in samsara, just like always. Don't you know what you have? You and you alone bring blessings to those you're connected with. You have the robes, you have the teachings, now you have to practice the method. You really have to practice. You have to work on purifying your five poisons, because if you don't, there is no hope for the world to get any better anytime soon. And the reason why things have gotten so bad is that, is that the good people in the world, I guess we've gotten complacent. We sort of abdicated our responsibility. We just float around. I don't know. But suddenly, the people that want to hate and are warmongers and, and really feel like the way to get to heaven is to kill as many people as you can, now suddenly that is on the rise. That kind of idea, that false religion. Where were we when that happened? I think to myself, if we were as hard at work practicing our path intimately, really giving rise to the bodhicitta, who knows? Maybe things might have been different. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that that's what we have to do now. That is most important that we live consciously, that it is most important that we practice, and it doesn't mean put in your hour every day, it means sit down with the book until it works for you. Read it over and over and over again until it means something to you. Don't give up until you feel a connect. And when you find yourself whining about how you've got to practice or whining about, oh, my teacher's not coming as often as, uh, to my teachings as I want, or, oh, I'm just, you know, it's so hard to be without a temple, and or whatever it is, that we're all whining and whining and whining. And when we think like that, we should think that the real problem is that the source of bodhicitta, the nectar of it, the outpouring of it, 
is not in your heart. Because that's where it has to be. You can't depend on anything outside of you. Nothing outside of you. You have to depend on the Guru seated within the throne of your heart, upon the throne of your heart. And that, that tendency to, to dress like a Buddhist and look like a Buddhist, but don't, don't have the, the qualities of a Buddhist or don't, or don't, what is the word? Wish to attain, aspire, that's the word, aspire to the qualities of the Buddha. We're wearing the robes, but we're not aspiring to any of that. that that's a little death, don't you understand? It's a kind of a death. To us that have made such a powerful commitment, to let it run dry like that, without nurturing what is inside you, without taking to heart the teachings that you've been given already, so many of them. It, it's, like, it's like a death. It's like a flower, a blossom, simply dying from lack of water. You know, we planted this Dharma garden in our minds so many years ago. Have we been faithful to the garden? Have we watered it? Have we fed it? Have we overwatered it with too much mush and gush and emotional bullshit? And have we over fertilized it with our own shit? When you plant a garden, you have to be mindful. You have to know that garden like it was your own self, your own heart. And it's like that with the Dharma garden within you. You can't let it just happen. You don't just show up every week and it rolls along. It's you. It is the unfolding of your mind, your nature. It is your reaching for liberation. It is your walking through the door. It, it's nonsensical, it's stupid to sit there and wait for the door to come to you. It isn't enough to hang out here in Sedona where everybody's spiritually high and hang out thinking we're Buddhists. Why don't we have a home here in Sedona yet? Because we don't have a home. We don't have a home. Where does Dharma live in you? Is it the treasure that it should be? And this great bodhicitta, why hasn't it simply unfolded here in Sedona? Why hasn't it sin simply just sprouted. Well, we haven't really nurtured it. We do our little Dharma projects, but we don't do it with heart. And I look at some of you, sometimes you all come to my house and you make it, you know, you do something, something for me or something for the birds or, and I look at you all and I think, look at them, their hearts are dead. What's happened? And then I looked in my heart and I thought, you know what? That's what's wrong with me. I miss them. I miss their prayers. I miss their devotion. I miss their faces when they practice beautiful acts and their faces become beautiful. And I can look at you and I can tell you that you have not practiced. You may have sat down with books, but you have not practiced. We need to give rise to the bodhicitta. We need to rebirth this precious essence. You must be wondering, isn't it tragic that you have given your life to something and that you have somehow lost it? 
to give your life to Dharma and then to lose it somewhere, it's like, it's like we put the baby down and walked away. You remember a while back I taught, I, I, start, I started to try to try to really make you all think about what will you bring into the new millennium? What have you brought into the new millennium? Here in this millennium, we need every morsel of love and compassion that any of us can bring about. Where is your voice in the world? Who do you tell about compassion? Who do you feed and nurture and love? Because this is the very soul of Dharma. The soul of Dharma isn't about looking cool, sitting on a bench and practicing with instruments. The soul of Dharma is about constant mindfulness and pure awareness, realizing that this is all phenomena and it's all externalized, and that the true essence is the bodhicitta. <clears throat> Our view has become so poor, we can't even see one another as precious practitioners. And of course we don't recognize one another's nature. We just don't see it that way. And so, of course, it's hard to practice devotion because we just don't see it that way. And something is dead. But the great thing about it is that everything is impermanent. And guess what? Cause and, cause and effect always work. I don't believe in hanging around going, oh, I didn't practice any dharma. Well, I'm bad. Maybe I'm a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, so you know, I don't believe in that. Here's what I believe. That if you look at yourself honestly and it breaks your heart, start now. Cause and effect always work. If, the, if your heart of dharma is dead, give rise to the causes that give it life. It's never too late. Never until you're dead. <clears throat> That's the great thing about Dharma. You can always turn it around. You can always get back on the horse. And it is essential that the struggle to purify poisons become stronger and, and, and more warrior-like than ever. And that our state of recognition, our constant mindfulness, becomes stronger and more juicy, delicious, so that it it's more attractive even than our own five poisons that are just wandering around in our minds. This is the most important thing. And I'll tell you that, have you looked at the uh, fundamentalist, um, the uh, Islamic fundamentalist regime? Um, I know that you all have watched enough TV and maybe know en enough about it to to know that this is not truly the Muslim faith. The Muslim faith is much different. These are, um, these people are like, a, a, as untypical and as untraditional as, let's say, snake handlers are to Christians. You know what I mean? You know that Christian faith where they all handle snakes and shout hallelujah and all that stuff? That's, it's that different to modern Christianity, let's say. And I'll tell you, the thing about this that is so very damaging 
is that this fundamentalist Islamic movement despises women. And they look, they turn away from the goddess, Tara. They turn away from her, they despise her, they spit on her. Every time they defile a woman in the way that they defile her, they have they trounce on, they spit on, they defile the 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 dakini that each woman is in potential. And that balance is so heavy right now, that, that heavy imbalance towards um, towards despising the female and holding the male up in some artificial way. Uh, it, it's very, it's very strong and very, very powerful right now. And the worst part about it is that they don't even realize what they're doing. It's so unconscious. They have no concept of Holy Mother Tara. They have no concept of pure view in which men are dakas and women are dakinis. And so they despise the women and they, they treat them horribly and, and they don't have any lives. I mean, it's just horrible. You cannot let this be the beginning of our planet evolving in that direction. You must practice Tara. You must recite the homages. You must see the Dakini in women. And women, you must see the Dhaka in men. Not the violator, but the Dhaka. This is the only thing that we can do to write that particular horrible imbalance. <clears throat> to uphold Tara in the world so that her blessing will not be denied to any of us. Because each of those women that are being mistreated and starving and, and living those horrible lives, they're all Tara, each and every one. And here's the world just going off on some sort of crazy, militant, warlike path. When I was at the farm, I can tell you that um, this happened the last day that I was there. Um, I was just sitting and thinking, and um, suddenly I heard these drums, and it was very clearly Damaru's, and it was like a whole chorus of them. And it was mixed in with some other sounds, but that's how it happens a lot. It depends on your um, perception. It was mixed in with some other sounds, but I could hear it. They were, and then I closed my eyes and see them. They were warlike knees. And they had their drums, and it was a rhythm like nothing I'd ever heard before. It was really, it was like charging drums. I can't explain it to you. It was really like, like, very, very um, syncopated, very active, very dynamic, uh, and, and, and uh, very precise. And looking at these dakinis, they were uh, warrior dakinis. Very strong, very vigilant, and they were, at, they were activated and at war. They are at war with this event that's happening. This unconscious hatred, this this bad blood that's running throughout the planet. And they are at war with it. Their goal, of course, is not to harm, but only to bring the bodhicitta to Earth, so that all of Earth's sentient beings can perceive the bodhicitta and rise to it. They want to, help, they want to help, but in this horrible time, they are like warriors. They have fangs, and they, they play their drums, and they cut us in the sky. And we have to remember that each one of us, in every kink and joint in your, in your psychic body, in every cell, there is a Dukkha and Dakini in union. Each and every part of you is so precious, so balanced, so perfect, so united in the bliss of the union of wisdom and the 
You have that within you, but they are asleep. Please wake them up. The Dakas and Dakinis with us, as well as the Dakas and Dakinis that guard the world, need of help that they can get. There are so many ability points that are happening right now. It could go a lot of this. Just yesterday, I think it was Rumsfeld said, a clip of Rumsfeld said, um, somebody needs to tell them that if they do any, uh, that if they get any biological or chemical warfare, that we will retaliate nuclear weapons, but that nothing is off the table. We've got to wake up now, people. There's no time. We have to wake up. We have to realize that this compassion of the Dakini is being defiled. It is being defiled. And that each of us tains within us the potency and possibility to contribute to a world that is suffering and crying. For this that is within us to be asleep. It's a trap. So we have to find a way to really give rise to the actual bodhicitta. We have to find a way to turn our practice into something living, something that the fire would grow even if nobody outside of you was fanning it, that it's so well established that it will surely last until the time of your death. The warmth of this bodhicitta is needed in the world now, and you cannot be an accidental practitioner. You cannot be somebody that just slides the home plate whenever possible. You've got to get involved. You have got to hold your practice up like this. Because yours is the path, the path that can bring about the answer to these problems. It seems nowadays that nobody in the world understands that cause and effect are connected. It says that we, anything we do is going to have no result. So we do whatever we want, and we get the usual results. Now that has to change. Because this is the time when on this planet everyone is giving rise to hatred and ignorance. And there are so many probability points that are happening right now It could go anyway. It could go anyway. So every bit of virtue, every bit of bodhicitta, every bit of practice matters so much. I see you walking around with your robes being all robely. I want to see your hearts. And you know, the part, what I want to see from you, you don't even really need me to talk to you. It's the part that you're in charge of. The part that says yes. Show me that. And we'll kick some ass. But I need you people, you are my first and onlys. Look at you, what a pitiful bunch. Jesus. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> you may be a motley crew, and I may be your motley leader, but guess what? For some reason, you all had the karma to be with me in the beginning and to be with me now. There's a reason for this. You all have to do. You've got to be responsible. Now is the time to wake up. I always knew this time would come, and I always knew I'd have a lot to do during this time. 
and I need your support. I need you to really practice. I need you to give your heart to Bodhicitta. I need you to I need you to want the Bodhicitta to be alive in the world more than you want to be right or than you want to be powerful or than you want to be on top. This is the time to let go of all your personal stuff. Try to understand there is not enough virtue in the world. And you cannot afford to let yours slide away. You know, forget acting like Dharma and talking like Dharma and wearing like Dharma. Be Dharma. Be Dharma. Be the heart of Dharma, which is the bodhicitta. Be the heart of Dharma, which is your perception and mindfulness. Challenge yourself. Look in your mind. See what's there. Weed that garden. Water it just right and not too much. And nurture it and keep it safe.
I'm talking away. Keep shutting me off. So anyway, thanks for joining us and um, and come back soon. I'm sorry if you couldn't hear me earlier. Um, you've probably heard the spiel before. So uh, it looks like it keeps shutting me down here. So we'll, we'll take that as a sign and go enjoy the wonderful day. Um, be safe. Take care. We'll see you soon. And for another teaching on Wednesday evening.